How many editions of Batman films do you have? Uh, a handful? You have a lot more than a handful of Batman video editions. Huh, well, uh... How many editions of Batman do you think we need on video? What, six? Six, six, six. Yeah, six is good. Hello and welcome back to this damn full idealistic crusade. In this video, I'm going to do a rough overview of the video release history of the original four Batman films and all their major US releases from Warner Home Video and how they have differed in the technical aspects, transfers, sound mixes, and how they fared on the overall formats. So that of course means starting with Batman 89 and I will go through in a sort of rough uh, release history order. So as I go through the years and the different formats and releases, we'll start running into the rest of the films in the series. But for the most part, all of the films sort of follow suit in the same sort of reissue pattern. And they, they of course, followed in the wake of Batman 89. So to start with Batman 89, you are primarily talking about the three major modes of consumer video format releases at the time. And Warner Home Video released the film on VHS. They also released it on beta as well. I think this is really the only Bat film to get a beta release. And then of course the Laserdisc release. Now, as was common at the time, uh, when you look at the VHS and Laserdisc, they are working from the same base master, the same film element transfer, and the same audio source. It's just going to be the differences in the format, overall presentation, and especially the aspect ratio. Now, the Bat films were shot spherically. None of them are anamorphic. So when you look at the VHS and 133 aspect ratio presentations, they are not pan and scan, but they are essentially open mat transfers. So essentially, that means you are seeing at least something closer to the full camera aperture of what was photographed on the set, but you are losing some information on the sides, and you're also seeing elements that were not really meant to be seen. And of course, some of that it is going to be framed a bit differently in, in terms of you're not getting the full camera aperture, but this was common for spherical films at the time, and it means it's kind of a good thing to hang on to the older 133 presentations if you're a big fan of these films because you are seeing additional picture information and little glimpses of the set that you don't get in the proper matted widescreen presentations but do keep in mind it was not the intended form uh, for these films to be seen opened up but that's how a lot of us grew up on them so these are not pan and scan jobs these are open mat presentations but open matting also had to have a really good person doing the actual video mastering. And some of these you'll notice if you look at the opened up versions, some of them are framed a bit better than others. So even open mat or opened up transfers could be, you know, they could vary in quality in terms of handling the action of the scene. Now to talk about the overall presentation of Batman 89 on the initial home video releases, I think for all these I'll start with the Laserdisc, which was basically the sort of premium version or presentation, and of course the one that was in widescreen with digital sound presentation. So this is the Warner Home Video Laserdisc. It replicates the original one sheet iconic poster art beautifully, which is the addition of some Warner Laserdisc uh, blurb uh, lines down here as to not distract from the cover. This is one of the most easily displayable LD covers you can get, and uh, that's why it's nice to get a copy with a really good condition jacket. It is a standard single pocket jacket with the lovely usage of Batman and Joker on the back as the imagery, and then we do get a healthy amount of chapter stops. And you can see, because this is still in the shrink wrap, it has the original $33.99 price somebody paid back in the day. I don't know if that was the original retail price, but I'm thinking it's probably a, 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 at least a slight sale price. Uh, the film is spread onto three sides and is a widescreen presentation. Uh, I should say matted widescreen, preserving the original ratio form, and it does include the film's original Dolby Stereo mix on the digital tracks, which is matrixed, and so it's the matrix stereo track. Now, the Laserdisc was what the home theater crowd would have gravitated towards, or the dedicated 
cinephiles. However, the mass major release that pretty much everyone else got was, of course, the VHS tape edition, which, of course, has the 4x3 or 133 uh, television sized ratio. So this is the opened up presentation, but it is working from the same base master as the Laserdisc. This, of course, is the original sleeve replicating the poster artwork and done in the Warner style of the time. I think this is burned into a lot of our brains because we were always re-watching the VHS edition growing up. Now this does carry the same Dolby Stereo, Matrix Stereo uh, encoded uh, presentation of the stereo mix, but being VHS, this is of course in VHS Hi-Fi, which still sounds really wonderful and is very underrated and was of very high quality, just not up to the same level as having the direct PCM stereo, matrix stereo presentation of the Laserdisc. So basically, the audio does replicate what's on the Laserdisc just in VHS Hi-Fi, and should you not have a Hi-Fi capable VCR, you would just be hearing the uh, the linear uh, tracks on the VHS tape, and then probably back in the day if you didn't have a fancier vcr that would be folded down to just mono or so you'd have a mono version fold down of the stereo mix but again the audio is pretty much the same as the laser disc and also the picture master is the same it's just the alternate ratio presentation because this is vhs and widescreen was never fully supported or unfortunately desired on uh, vhs by most consumers and just to look at the tape label this, of course, is the original Warner tape label. This is what, of course, the uh, DC Comics recently replicated on their Batman 89 comic uh, collected hardcover trade edition. Uh, so if you take that dust jacket off, and you can see it in my review of that comic, they did replicate this Warner Home Video Batman label. Now, when you talk about the Betamax release of Batman 89, it looks pretty much identical to the VHS release, except the, for the fact that it's a beta release. Now, as far as I'm aware, uh, Batman 89 is the only film of the series that got a beta release, because at some point, I guess, between uh, Batman and Returns, Warner star stopped really supporting the, the beta format. I don't know if there's a particular sort of line in the sand or a particular year that they just stopped uh, using beta, but uh, most studios around this time eventually just kind of threw in the towel and went specifically just VHS and Laserdisc exclusive. It seems Paramount was really the holdout. They stuck with a lot of formats a lot longer than others. They even ventured into the SVHS format, uh, which most other studios didn't bother with, and uh, the beta usage by Paramount lasted sporadically all the way up until uh, the first Mission Impossible film in 1996. So uh, that's why Beta dropped out so quickly on the Batman film series, because again, it seems like Warner Home Video kind of dropped Betamax uh, somewhere between 89's release on video and Batman Returns. It should also be said that the Batman 89 tape had a greater percentage of ownership because this was a tape sold at a much lower uh, list price to try and entice more people to buy it and to get the sales numbers up. So this was one of those sort of benchmark uh, VHS releases that uh, sort of caused an industry shift because it was sold at a lower price to try and move more copies and get a greater amount of copies sold. Now to talk about the technical aspects of the release of 89 in its first sort of of video iterations coming from the same master. Now, both of the Tim Burton directed Batman films were famously very dark in their uh, design and visual appearance, especially in the in and on the original theatrical release run, looking at release prints. Now, when it came to home video, that was not necessarily going to cooperate very well with uh, consumer equipment at the time, and especially CRT televisions. And the fear with darker films was always that you were going to lose important picture information and people might complain that the image was too dark. So quite frequently, most films were at least uh, brightened to some degree in the mastering process. And so if you look at most older video masters, they're going to be nowhere near as dark as release prints or film elements or modern scans, which obviously don't have to uh, deal with that particular issue. However, with both Batman 89 and Batman Returns, because they were physically designed to be darker, I mean that basically in the video mastering process, that visually uh, they did have to go in or they felt the need to go in and brighten the films overall. So if you remember the Burton Batman films being 
uh, a certain way on video and how the, how they were a, a bit brighter and the, the contrast was was a bit different looking. Uh, that's that's the reason why because they were essentially brightened up a little bit in the video mastering process and in the actual process of making the video master that was then used for all the major releases. So that means when you're looking at 89 on Laserdisc, VHS, and Beta, and even the first DVD release to some degree. It's a lot brighter than it should be, and you are also seeing further into the set backgrounds than you really are supposed to, and the shadow detail is greatly diminished. But again, this is really working around the constraints of equipment at the time, and also the sort of trends of home video and video mastering around this time, you know, basically talking about 1990, roughly. So when you look at it compared to other video editions at that time, or on vintage equipment you can see why this was done but it is rather plainly obvious that this was not the original theatrical look 100 percent it is a well done master for the time though so the, technically it still holds up very well but you do have to keep in mind that it has been brightened up and this would also happen to a degree on batman returns and it wasn't until Really, the, the the more modern scans of these films, and especially the the newest uh, go round in the 4K realm, that that issue was at least finally addressed to a greater degree. So basically, with each successive release, we've gotten a little bit closer to the fully very dark and very brooding sort of of dark look of the original release version. So that means for both Burton films on home video, they've have had a sort of varied uh, visual quality over the years. And that's the reason why, because the, the actual films were visually so dark that they were somewhat tweaked for home video standards at the time. But then you look at the audio track on these releases. Again, it is a Dolby Matrix uh, stereo track, so it's a four-channel Matrix stereo presentation on both the VHS and Laserdisc, and of course the Beta as well. And what it seems to be is a version of the standard 35 millimeter Dolby Stereo release version of the film. So basically what most everyone heard in the general release. Uh, Batman 89 had technically three different theatrical release mixes. There was the 70 millimeter blow up with a six track Dolby Stereo uh, mix. There was the standard 35 millimeter release with Dolby Stereo matrix. And then there were also some 16 millimeter prints made, which seemed to have either just a plain mono or stereo track on them because 16 millimeter was never set up for anything beyond that so I'm, I'm pretty sure that's just a fold down of of the Dolby stereo I saw a 16 millimeter print of 89 ones and it just seemed like a like a flat version of the the standard Dolby stereo but that's that that 16 millimeter version is like the the other sort of uh, variant mix that or fold down that most films uh, of the 80s and 90s had that just kind of became secondary and uh, was never intended as a primary mix, but has kind of gotten lost to time. But technically, there there were there were three iterations on actual prints made. But when you look at the film on VHS and Laserdisc specifically. There is a certain quality to the actual mix presentation itself that is not replicated past a certain point on video releases. And it's, it's kind of a shame because it makes me kind of gravitate back towards these because the Dolby Stereo presentation on here, which I'm guessing was probably taken straight from the original theatrical print master uh, because uh, back in the day for Laserdisc particularly, when they would source audio and, and they had already added digital PCM sound to disc, a lot of studios were going in and just literally making direct transfers and copies from master elements or source elements. And so typically that would be your print master that was used for making the theatrical release prints or sometimes the actual audio negative source itself or even going back to stems and doing remixes and things. So a lot of times you get almost a one-to-one -one copy of the best source at the time when, since it was a new film, when the source was still new and fresh. And they didn't go in and use a lot of compression or added EQ or messed around with it. 
So there is, in particular with 89, there's a greater, much greater sense of low end. There's a greater low end with that adds a certain warmth to the sound, and it, it adds a certain uh, sort of sonic character, if you will, that I, I think just fits beautifully with Batman 89. And it's something I've come to love and enjoy so much that I, when I look at the modern releases that feature remixes or new audio harvests, um, and that that quality is no longer there, it, it, it kind of doesn't feel the same. And I miss the 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 low end warmth essentially of the Dolby stereo tracks on the VHS, Laserdisc, and obviously the beta release as well. So uh, again, I'm just having to kind of guess at what the source was, but again, I think it was most likely the 35 millimeter general release print master of the Dolby Stereo track. So essentially when you're watching these, you are getting, as far as I can tell, a direct copy of what you would have heard on the general release prints back in 1989. Of course, it could be somehow possible that they used the 70 millimeter mix as a source and just put it out in the uh, best available home system at the time, which was still Matrix Stereo. This did happen sometimes, very occasionally, and around this time, the widescreen Laserdisc of Superman the movie actually utilized the much rarer and the best original mix of that film, which was its 70 millimeter mix, which didn't see another release on home video until the initial pressings of that film on its 4K UHD release. And so for years, I had to just kind of guess and I, I was like I swear this has got to be the 70 millimeter mix uh, although it's just like folded down to matrix stereo and then I finally get got that sort of proven when it turned up in 5.1 and it was the same mix on the UHD so essentially I can't be 100% for certain that this is the 35 millimeter Dolby stereo source mix I'm pretty positive but again there's there's a slight chance it could be derived from the 70 millimeter mix itself however that that's also slightly more debatable when I get uh, to a little bit later in this video when I talk about one of the newer sound presentations. So uh, that's basically how Batman 89 turned up on home video in the three major consumer release forms at the time. And this kind of set the, the sort of standard that the rest of the films would follow on their initial releases because outside of dropping Betamax as a format, Warner Home Video kind of followed the same release pattern through the rest of the 1990s until DVD came around and sort of changed things up a little bit. So you would basically see a widescreen laser disc and then a 133 VHS release from the same master and with no real notion of special features or anything but each would feature the uh, the matrix stereo track and either VHS hi-fi or PCM on the laser disc and the laser disc would be the slightly fancier release and the release geared more towards the home theater enthusiast of the 1990s which is why they would always be widescreen they would include CAV final sides where possible and of course you get the benefit of the better sound quality along with the picture quality uptick. So then we move to Batman Returns which again followed pretty much the same release pattern. So here we have the Batman Returns Laserdisc again with original poster artwork Nice a glossy sleeve, but uh, sadly no gatefold. So as with most Warner discs, uh, you have to try and find a clean jacket copy without a bunch of corner dings and spine wear. And I was finally able to get this really nice condition jacket. The rear also shows how Warner did put a little extra effort into their Batman releases in terms of better utilizing the space on the rear jacket. We're again looking at the film spread out over three sides with side three nicely done in CAV for full feature format, a good selection of chapter stops, and of course the artwork is basically replicating what turned up on the VHS tape release. We do get the film's uh, Dolby Stereo 2.0 SR track as what's on the digital PCM tracks. So you're basically getting the standard general release Dolby Stereo SR track, uh, which is what most people heard in theaters on a uh, replicated perfectly here 
on the digital stereo tracks, which then you would matrix out at home. And once again, like 89, the Laserdisc is where you went for the widescreen matted presentation. Uh, otherwise, you'd be looking at the opened up version on the VHS tape release. Now, in terms of the technical aspects and transfer and overall Laserdisc pressing, this follows with most uh, typical Warner Laserdisc. If you've seen any Warner's LD from the 90s, you can kind of understand what pretty much the rest are like. So this is very much like the presentation of 89, where you have the uh, transfer obviously brightened up significantly from the original film elements and the release prints. Now, I have actually gotten to see a release print of Returns, and it was a preserved uh, studio print from Warner. So I've seen Warner's actual preserved Fuji color print uh, from 1992 and it is definitely the most vivid and dark version of Returns I've ever seen, and it looked gorgeous. Uh, but you can obviously tell going back to the original video releases that they have been brightened up, and for lack of a better term, they have a slight sort of video feel to them. So if you ever wondered why the Burton films kind of look like that back in the day when you would watch them at home, that's why. So just like 89, this has been brightened up a bit, although not quite as much across the board as 89, because of course, this is a slightly later film. It was shot uh, in Los Angeles. It was processed and handled differently, had a different production designer. So it's a different looking film anyway, but it has that same dark visual sensibility. And so the early video transfers were brightened up, although I don't think it, it suffers quite as much as 89. Uh, that being said that the actual transfer is a, a little bit noisy here and there and overall I think 89 is actually a slightly better laser disc across the board in terms of the actual video master and, and pressing quality uh, the other factor with returns you have to watch out for is unfortunately returns does suffer from laser rot now, this can happen with some laser disc pressings particularly ones pressed at particular plants and while 89 was is a perfect pioneer pressing unfortunately returns was not pressed by pioneer and i believe this was handled by uh, by warner's actual plant in the usa which actually could result in some rotted discs and unfortunately returns does pop up frequently with laser rod i've gone through a couple copies and usually it's not terrible usually it's just some colored speckling and some audio issues but it can get pretty bad and then randomly you will find a copy like this where there is no laser rot. So they, they are out there. They did make some that, that did not develop laser rot, but uh, unfortunately two of the Batman films of the four do suffer from, from laser rot. So this is a film you do have to try and find a clean laser disc copy of, or you can import the Japanese copy uh, just to get a rot free version, which otherwise is using the same master. Then you move to the much wider release of the VHS version. Again, using the poster artwork sized for a VHS sleeve. Still looks nice and has a nice gloss to it, but this was one of the tapes I had growing up, so that's why it definitely has some more wear to it because I had Returns and Forever uh, on VHS first and, and watched them uh, incessantly pretty much. But it does otherwise look like a slimmed down version of the Laserdisc and is a 133 rendering. So this is essentially, again, opened up uh, from the original uh, 185 presentation. So the Laserdisc is replicated more of the theatrical experience while the VHS tape is giving you that opened up presentation but it is from the same master so just like the laser disc it's also obviously brightened up for uh, consumer uh, essentially format and desires of the time even though this is already 92 and that's starting to become slightly less common. It was still pretty much prevalent in the industry. Now this release does not have a printed label. It's just actually printed on the tape itself. And my apologies, as you can see, I forgot to rewind this tape. I was I was reviewing uh, various uh, various copies before uh, before recording this, and I just forgot to fully rewind my returns tape. But you can see Warner had already transitioned away from doing printed on labels. And again, this does carry the matrixed Dolby Stereo track on the VHS Hi-Fi uh, track, 
but of course you would otherwise have the linear stereo if not folded down to linear mono if you didn't have a hi-fi vcr now there is something unique and important about these releases having that audio track and uh, cinema audio nerds out there will probably already know that returns was the first film to utilize and be fully released in the then new dolby digital 5.1 system which had a variety of different names and eventually came to be regarded as Dolby Digital or Dolby Digital 5.1 or simply AC3. And this would eventually find its way onto video formats a couple years later when it was uh, redevised and uh, a version was made for Laserdisc. So this means there are two mixes of returns. You have the Dolby Digital 5.1 track and you have the more traditional Dolby Matrix Stereo 2.0 SR track which would be matrixed out into four channel stereo. Now, uh, Dolby Digital 5.1 only had certain theaters that were capable of playing it and utilizing it uh, when returns came out. So you had to basically go and see one of those special engagements in a larger city market to actually hear the film in Dolby Digital. So that means most people heard the film on what most prints had in the general release, which was the 2.0 SR Matrix stereo track. So if you want to replicate that original experience, that's why these older releases are important. And when I saw Warner's print, it was the 2.0 SR track matrixed out and sounded lovely and exactly like what I had you know, grown up with and become accustomed to on these releases. Now, after this point, uh, we did switch over to a 5.1 or discrete audio track from the DVD onwards. And it, it seems as if the initial releases in 5.1 are the theatrical 5.1 track, but again, one can only guess because there's no definite information anywhere. But when you compare the 2.0 SR uh, Matrix track on these releases to that first DVD with 5.1 discrete, uh, it, they are the same base track. The differences are, of course, in what a discrete track can do versus the limitations of the Matrix stereo form. However, like a lot of films in the early 5.1 era, you know, and throughout the 90s, really, Matrix Stereo didn't just go away, and it was still a primary uh, mixing method. And, of course, they knew most theaters would not be equipped for discrete, or if you had dropouts, you had to make sure the Matrix Stereo track on the prints was solid, because the problem with Dolby Digital is it was put in between these sprocket holes, and if there was any damaged dirt or anything that got on uh, on the film itself, uh, the track wouldn't read properly and you'd have dropouts or it would cut out entirely. And so the backup or the failsafe was the optical track containing the 2.0 SR. And so you'd have a film that cut in and out of digital uh, 5.1 Dolby to the Dolby optical SR track. So it was not only a failsafe, it was also a lot of films couldn't even afford to or didn't go for discrete and just kept with Dolby Stereo. So it's important to hang on to these tracks. But when you're looking at it from a fan's perspective, what you get in the 2.0 SR versus the 5.1 is, I mean, it's kind of a slightly more old-timey feel, if you will. It makes it sound a bit more like a, like a film from the late 80s or of its time period in 92 because you get a little bit more boominess because the your, your, your subwoofer or your speakers will pick up more of the low end and it's not full-on discreet. Um, obviously, a Matrix track can't be as perfectly refined as a discreet multi-channel track, so it can't quite hit... It doesn't hit the, quite the same highs as the discreet 5.1, but it makes for an interesting in comparison and the matrix stereo track is no slouch and in some ways maybe it's a little bit more again slightly warm or intimate feeling in a way so it, it's just a, a sign of the point at which we were in cinema sound and it makes for a fascinating comparison going back and looking at the matrix stereo track matrixed out in your home theater and jumping back and forth between that and the discrete 5.1 so i encourage fans of returns in film sounds to do this to get a sort of idea of directly comparing the same source mix in two different formats and seeing sort of the the the, the pluses to either approach and obviously the technological superiority of having a discrete track. So that's why these releases are important sonically because they do preserve the 
theatrical release 2.0 Dolby Stereo SR track, even though the 5.1 uh, mix was technically the, the groundbreaking element because this was the first mass release in Dolby Digital 5.1. Now we move to 1995's Batman Forever, which again had the spiffier widescreen version on Laserdisc with the original poster artwork, some nice gloss on the cover, but again being Warner, no gatefold, so you do have to worry about getting cover damage because it's two discs crammed in here. Nice usage of the rear cover, basically expanding what was on the VHS and adding your chapter stops on the side. Film is again spread over three sides, and we do get side three and CAV, which is a nice bonus. So you can step frame and have full feature capability for the finale. Once again, we do have the widescreen presentation on this master, along with a Dolby Stereo SR track matrixed on the PCM stereo tracks. But we also get the bonus of having a Dolby AC3 5.1 track on the analog channel. So this means this is the first film to have its 5.1 track in the series on a disc release. So you have the actually both theatrical audio presentations on the Laserdisc. So this means also the next film would also have its AC3. So this basically came out after AC3 was uh, developed for home edition. And so it is in the traditional AC3 form on Laserdisc where they would modulate it onto one of the analog backup channels. And then you had to have an RF demodulator to decode it back out and basically give you your uh, Dolby Digital stream which would then go through your receiver. But uh, of course, you have to have the all-important demodulator box. Now, this does replicate both theatrical audio presentations. And you would think that the 5.1 AC3 is the obvious go-to choice because it's the technically superior system. And it would basically make the, uh, the old 2.0 SR track just like a historical artifact or a backup. Well, you would be wrong because and I think this is tied to the film's very troubled uh well, I should say very troubled um, editing history because, of course, the film was re-edited and uh, we never saw the original edition of the film as it was shot and intended. And that's, of course, getting into the whole uh, what's labeled the Schumacher cut territory of Batman Forever, uh, which does need to be released in some form by Warner Brothers or at least officially acknowledged. So there is uh, quite a lot of the film that we never got to see outside of various glimpses over the years. But if you look closely at the film's audio, you'll notice that it is very heavily ADR throughout most of the dialogue. And while the 5.1 mix is good, I, I just... I always wish it was a little bit better. It's 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 very good, but you can also very clearly tell that uh, when the ADR comes up, the dialogue has a certain sort of difference in the actual um, the actual noise floor of the center channel. So it's one of those things that once you notice it, you can't unnotice it. And I just think that probably has something to do with with the film's re-editing history, and also um, a, a lot of the ADR is different from the onset line readings and different things. So I can only assume it was part of the re-editing process. But when you look at the Dolby Surround or Dolby Stereo SR Matrix track, it's better integrated in terms of the, the mix itself seems better integrated and the ADR is actually less noticeable. And it also utilizes the, the surround uh, channel uh, to honestly, I think, a, a more engaging and consistent degree than the discrete 5.1 does. So this is one of the very few random weird times that the Matrix stereo track, I think, is actually better mixed and a better way to hear the film overall than the 5.1 discrete. And for some reason, I've noticed this on a couple of mid-90s Warner Brothers titles. Again, why? I don't know exactly. Uh, but here on Forever, I think it's just... It's slightly better uh, mixed uh, in terms of all the elements coming together. Again, you don't notice the, the ADR dialogue as much because it's a bit better integrated and the matrixing kind of hides that, that uh, ADR quality a little bit in the center channel. I think the mono surround of the matrix mix is actually a, a more consistent surround usage than the uh, discrete, which is kind of more sporadic in its usage. And even the, the, the low end uh, seems to be just a bit 
boomier and more powerful because matrix tracks tend to kind of do that when you're on a modern system with a subwoofer because uh, there's no discrete LFE channel. The the subwoofer and your your speakers kind of just pick up on more of more of the low end and there's there's kind of a natural boominess that that comes from that. But if you ever have the opportunity to compare the two, I, I think it makes it for a fascinating discussion in film sound because even though the source mix is the same and both still are dealing with the heavy use of ADR, I think the Matrix Stereo track is actually the better mix, even though it's not discrete and it doesn't have quite the detail of the 5.1. I just think overall it's it's a better incorporated mix, and it's one of the few times where the technically inferior matrixing process, I think, yielded better results than the discrete. Now we switch over to the VHS tape release. As you can see, I owned this when I was a little kid, and so it's definitely the most worn of my VHS copies, but we still have the same sort of design aesthetic tying it to returns in 89. We have the spine, which again, sort of sort of keeps in the same uh, design aesthetic. Then the rear, as you can see, is the same art we got on the Laserdisc release. And we, of course, have the Dolby Surround credit. So this has the Dolby Surround or Dolby Stereo 2.0 mix that I've just breathed about on the hi-fi track. So you can actually hear this same track even if you don't have a Laserdisc player by just popping on the VHS and decoding, matrixing out the hi-fi track. Again, Warner did not make a label. They were just printing directly on the tape at this time. So of course, Forever follows suit. And just like the previous films, of course, Forever's VHS release was in a 4x3 or 1.3 three aspect ratio opened up from the original 185 matting so you have basically the what would be termed full screen vhs for the mass market and you have the letterbox laser disc for more of the home cinephile or home theater enthusiast and that way warner was kind of covering all their bases but the upside here is of course these films were all shot spherically and so these vhs tapes were not pan and scan affairs they were merely more open mat presentations so not the way they were meant to be seen, but you're not losing major picture information and having somebody do a bad pan and scan job on them. So that did make them more enjoyable to watch, whether you knew that factor or not. It, your, your brain would recognize a open mat uh, film transfer versus a uh, pan and scan effort, even subconsciously. So uh, that makes the Forever release important for having what I think is the slightly better 2.0 Matrix stereo track on its original releases. And the Video Master, because it's a 95 film, was new at the time, uh, it, it is quite good for its time on both VHS and Laserdisc. And it is, of course, a very colorful film in spots, but it's also, you know, it was shot on film and it does have darker elements, so it does have some necessary shadow detail and it was not brightened up like the Burton films were, at least to the same degree. There's a little bit of that in every older video transfer, but I think Forever at least retained more of its release appearance overall than the previous two Burton films did. So with the Schumacher films, you don't have that same sort of intensive brightening of the overall image to the same degree. Uh, you have to worry more about the most colorful elements being tamed or being constrained within the NTSC video standards of the time. That's that's slightly more of the issue here. Uh, but of course, with successive uh, later scans and uh, better technology, all of these uh, visual parts would come more to the forefront in the most modern 4K releases. So uh, again, you're still having to worry about NTSC video standards of the time, but essentially Forever uh, holds up a lot better in terms of it. the video releases do preserve more of the original uh, image and design of the visuals than unfortunately what happened on the Burton films getting bright up on their video releases. And then, of course, the Eisman Kameth! And we got Batman and Robin in 1997, which did see this Warner Brothers widescreen Laserdisc release with the original poster artwork with a nice glossy sleeve. But of course, being Warner, no gatefold. So usually you find this all dinged up with uh, corner wear and spine wear and so on and so forth. So still following in the same release pattern. But it should be noted 
that, as you can see here on the jacket, this was actually handled by Image Entertainment. And what that means is that this was when Warner was already starting to shift focus onto the then new DVD format. And so after a certain point, all of their laser discs were done in more limited quantities and handled more by Image. So uh, at this point, Warner was, sh their focus had shifted almost entirely onto DVD, which was starting to rev up at this time, and they were still Still doing VHS for mass release and Laserdisc kind of became the, the distant third but a lot of the well pretty much the video masters that were being prepared were still kind of geared for Laserdisc in mind and then being ported over to VHS and then these Laserdisc masters were then ported over for the DVD which was an early format and for all of its early years it was pretty much just doing Laserdisc ports and Unfortunately, not very well, so a lot of late-release Laserdiscs are quite often, if not always, better than their initial DVD ports, even though that format was technically better. They did, they, it took them a while to, to get work the kinks out, essentially. So that's why the, the first couple years of DVD, you're seeing nothing but noisy-looking Laserdisc ports. Once again, we have the film on three sides, with side three in full-feature CAV format. We do have a 2.0 surround matrix track on the digital PCM track, in addition to having the film's Dolby Digital 5.1 AC3 discrete on the right analog channel. So uh, this, of course, follows in the same style as forever and building off of the going all the way back to the 89 Laserdisc in the standard Warner style. Uh, decent usage of artwork. And of course, obviously, this was sized for VHS and they just the other half was for the chapter stops. We do get a nice amount of chapter stops, but again, as typical for Warner, no real extras. This is just the way you got the better picture quality, an actual widescreen master presentation, and having PCM uh, 2.0 matrix surround. But most importantly, at the time, this is how you got the 5.1 AC3 discrete track, should you wish to add Batman and Robin to your collection. Now, this is, again the most difficult to find of the four films on Laserdisc because it had the least amount printed and it's getting closer to the end of the format. The other issue is, of course, just like Returns, this is also a rather notorious and notable Rotter title. But unlike Returns, this film has much more frequent discs that are completely rotted or unplayable uh, or getting to be unplayable. So it is very difficult to find a clean copy with a good jacket at a decent price that also doesn't have any laser rot. So I kind of I, I kind of hemmed and hawed for years if I was going to eventually get this because I didn't want to have to try and track down a non-rotted copy again. But uh, eventually I, I found this one in good shape at a good price, and it only has a very tiny bit of speckling at the start of side three. And thankfully that is the only sign of rot this has ever had or developed. And otherwise, it's a very, very impressive uh, video master and uh, laser disc pressing on a visual standard and of course this being even more colorful than batman forever it definitely goes more for that sort of eye-popping uh color uh, approach as is pretty much everybody knows about this film so if you're looking for a really impressive later laserdisc presentation that really has a lot of impressive color for ntsc video at the time and fine detail and things this is a very impressive looking disc. It's actually one of the better looking LDs I've ever seen. The trouble is just finding one that isn't rotted. So this is a rather impressive NTSC laser disc transfer. Uh, if you do want to get a, want an easier way to get a non-rotted copy, of course, you can just import or pick up the Japanese version, which is the same master, but does not have the rot problem, but of course also has hard-coded Japanese subtitles. Of course, the mass release was the V. VHS tape. Again, using the poster artwork and looking just like a slimmed down version of the Laserdisc once again, we do have a slightly similar side label to the earlier films, but of course changed because they put all the character headshots on there to remind you that you had Batman and Robin on VHS on your shelf, I guess. And then the rear, again, is pretty much just the left half of the rear cover of the Laserdisc. Uh, again, having the 2.0 Matrix Stereo on the Hi-Fi track 
and also being the opened up 133 presentation. So essentially making this an open matted 133 transfer instead of being pan and scan. So the, the releases all follow suit from what happened to 89. Uh, again, like forever, this is a, even a nice looking VHS tape because it's of course getting on to be at the end or towards the end of the 90s and it does not have the same sort of over brightening effect that was applied to the Burton films either so it also has that going for it so uh, it's it's a pretty solid VHS release and also surprisingly Warner switched back and made an actual label so this has an actual printed label on it's a, a little black standard label which i had kind of forgotten about because i hadn't pulled out the vhs in a while so batman and robin got a printed label now when you look at the audio tracks there is at least some uh, degree of what i discussed on forever the 2.0 matrix track while you would think it's not going to be on the same levels as the 5.1 it does also sound a little bit different although i don't think it's absolutely essential like the forever track is so i don't think the matrix stereo track of batman and robin is better than the discrete 5.1 ac3 um, but i do think it's important to have as a secondary track because the mixing just like on forever does sound different enough to uh, you know make it an interesting sort of alternate presentation so if you've never seen batman and robin on the older releases it can be fun to go and look at a pretty spiffy standard depth transfer from back then with the alternative matrix stereo track um, uh, i just think it sounds different enough to to still warrant having it uh, kept on modern releases in addition to the 5.1 discrete but it's not a case like forever where the i think the matrix track on that film is actually uh, overall actually a better presentation than the discrete but i do think the track on batman and robin is just different enough to uh, make it of mention and importance now we do need to make a brief mention of one other sort of side release that happened in 1998 warner did do a very very limited run of a final vhs iteration of the batman films and they actually made widescreen letterboxed vhs presentations now, this seems to be tied around the sort of revisit of the films on the DVD releases, which came out in 97, and there was apparently a sort of final Laserdisc planned for, I guess, at least the Burton films, because I think they were being prepared for a reissue with AC3 5.1 Dolby Digital Sound, as a lot of films did have at the end of the Laserdisc format. They got some sort of reissue with multi-channel sound, and usually a slightly spiffed up version of the original disc master however those plans seem to have been cancelled like unfortunately a lot of laser disc reissues because dvd already started taking off and that sort of took most studios focus but they did put out these widescreen vhs releases which seem pretty much identical in the artwork the only difference is the front cover has this little red banner across the top for special widescreen edition and that's how you differentiate them uh, in addition to the fact that they carry a manufactured date on the back or a copyright date of 1998 so i can only guess they were struck from the 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 widescreen master that was being the source for the 1997 dvds in widescreen and that were actually being really derived from the widescreen laserdisc video masters but you know spiffed up a little and and worked on a little bit so uh, this is probably the least discussed aspect of the video release history and even uh, until a couple years ago, something I wasn't even aware of. So it does seem as if all four films did get a widescreen release at this time. However, they were in extraordinarily small, limited quantities, and they only pop up on eBay sporadically, which is how I stumbled across them a, a few years ago. And I was like, I had no idea they made widescreen tapes. So uh, even I didn't know these existed, but apparently they did in 1998. And again, if you do want to track these down, they are very, very uncommon, but they do pop up sporadically. And you'll just be looking for that red a special widescreen edition banner on the top of the actual VHS sleeve. So that brings us to essentially 1997 when Warner Brothers decided to use the Batman films as as 
sort of semi-launch titles for the, the new DVD format. Their first couple discs had already started coming out in 1996, early 1997, and they very quickly realized the Batman films would be very helpful in selling DVDs, so we got the 1997 Snapper Case DVDs of the Bat films. This is the release of 89, and what these did was essentially take the place of the AC3 5.1 uh, widescreen Laserdisc reissues of the Burton films, and then essentially port the Laserdisc masters of Forever and Batman and Robin. So we get the traditional Warner Snapper case style. We get the rear, which basically redoes the artwork and keeps the critical blurbs and then resizes, reformats everything for DVD. Now, it does, of course, list special features, but this being an early, closer to launch this, those are, of course, very limited. And you have the very amusingly dated early Warner DVD attempts at menus. Of course, we have the iconic snap that everybody kind of hated for years and now we kind of have nostalgia for. Uh, we do have some nice interior art, of course, with some chapter stops as well. And this basically is trying to replicate the rear cover of the Laserdisc, though, because it's smaller, it's nowhere near as impressive. Now, the disc itself is just a flipper disc. And the reason for this is this is actually two different presentations on all of these. On the main side, you have the widescreen matted presentation, which does seem to be drawing directly from the Laserdisc Master Source. So it looks very similar to the LD, but of course, being an early DVD, it's got a lot of compression noise, a lot of edge enhancement. It definitely does not look good in 2023. Uh, you know, it's technically better than the Laserdisc, but the Laserdisc doesn't have any of those problems. And if you're watching on a CRT uh, or a good Laserdisc setup, it blows the DVD out of the water, even though this is a component format. That's most early DVDs in a nutshell because they're not very good Laserdisc ports anyway. The difference here is this does carry a 5.1 discrete track, as all of the DVDs do. So again, this kind of takes the place, I believe, of the planned Dolby AC3 5.1 Laserdisc reissues that were canceled. And it is the same sound source as the lovely mix I love on the Laserdisc. So what you're getting here on the DVD is essentially a port of the uh, the track on the Laserdisc, but you're getting it upgraded to a discrete 5.1 track. So again, this pretty much is what we didn't get on that canceled Laserdisc reissue, and you are getting that 5.1 AC3 track that would have been on the Laserdisc, and had that disc existed, it would probably still be one that a lot of Laserdisc collectors tried to find because those AC3 later period LD reissues can be really wonderful and usually contain very excellent 5.1 tracks on them. Now, the one issue with the widescreen presentation on this disc that's pretty noted um, among home video enthusiasts is, unfortunately, I guess the video operator making this or whoever thought that uh, when Kim Basinger's Vicky Vale in the climax starts uh, coming on to the Joker and she's kissing up his sleeve and she stops and pulls like the piece of lint out of her mouth. Apparently they thought that was a mistake, I guess, because the widescreen version just literally snips that out. So there's a little jump cut in the widescreen version on this disc. Um, that's been talked about on forums since video file forums existed. So that's that's the one real, real thing to note about this is for some reason, uh, somebody I guess thought that was a mistake and, and cut that out. However, on side B of the flipper disc, uh, that is actually intact because what they did on side B was give you the 133 presentation that you would have gotten on the VHS tape releases on all four films. So that makes these DVDs important to hang on to. If you like looking at alternate ratio presentations, you can actually look at the opened up versions of the films in much higher quality than what you got on VHS uh, simply by having the original flipper disc. So that's why they are flipper discs. Um, but of course, it's still an early DVD encoding and not obviously the greatest and very dated, but it does also contain the 5.1 mix and it doesn't have the little uh, error jump cut. So uh, it's kind of actually 
the most important reason to have this, uh, the alternate ratio presentation and the discrete 5.1 version of the audio that turned up on the VHS and Laserdisc that I love so much. So that's why the Snapper Case DVD of 89 is actually quite important and interesting. Now, everything I just said about 89 carries over onto Returns. This is the 1997 Snapper Case DVD flipper disc with both ratio presentations. And importantly for Returns, this was the first video release to have have a Dolby 5.1 track, which does seem to, at least as far as I can tell, replicate what would have been on the original theatrical Dolby Digital 5.1 track. But again, that's just me hazarding a guess. Uh, this is what you can compare with the Laserdisc or VHS tape to get, I guess, the best sort of direct idea about the two different forms of the original audio. The design is pretty much identical. We get the nice artwork and a flipper disc, but again, I'm just trying to keep the disc from <laughs> glaring out my camera and picking up the light. Uh, it's just not as impressive as the LD jacket due to size. And just like 89, this is a very dated looking disc now because it's also a very early, if not close to DVD launch title, because this is of course a 1997 DVD. And also, as I said on 89, this is pretty much what we would have gotten on a AC3 5.1 Laserdisc reissue had Warner actually come out with those and not canceled them. Then of course we got the DVD of Forever released at the same time, carrying over the same sort of port of the Laserdisc Master, also the same art essentially as the VHS tape, just slightly resized. We have the inside of the snapper case with nice looking artwork, just not as dramatic uh, due to the laser disc being the bigger size. And we again get a flipper disc with both ratio presentations. Now, sonically, this has the 5.1 track, but you lose the matrix stereo track. And I do think that is really a shame because I think that track is very important and actually I think it's better than the 5.1 overall. So uh, that's the the one of the downgrades about having this. And also the other is it's a port of the Laserdisc Master with a lot of early DVD era nastiness going on. So I actually don't think it looks as good as watching the Laserdisc on a good setup because it's essentially just a 1997 port of the LD Master and it just has a lot of crumminess and compression baked into it. So there's a lot of noise and crud in this just like all of these 97 DVDs, so do keep that in mind. But you do actually have a nicer option of looking at the opened up presentation on here in component video as opposed to actually going back to the VHS tape. And then of course you have Batman and Robin following suit. This uses the same video master source as the Laserdisc, has the same sort of matching art. The rear replicates what's on the Laserdisc and VHS tape release. You do get the little sort of art card with your chapters inside and the flipper disc with both ratio presentations. And again, like forever, this is essentially porting the laser disc and keeping the 5.1 AC3 track, but dropping the matrix stereo track, which again, I think is kind of a shame because I think it is a, a nice solid way to look at this film and it should be kept because it is, I think, just different enough. So that means the Matrix Stereo track for both Forever and Batman and Robin is pretty much VHS and Laserdisc exclusive. And then all four DVDs were collected slightly later in this Batman Legacy slip box, which basically is just a little cardboard slip box that contained all four snapper cases. This was done in 2000, and this is how I picked them up and got all of the DVDs in one go. So originally I went from VHS to then DVD, then the next set of DVDs, then the Blu-rays, then I went to the Laserdisc because I don't just go continually forward. I just go forward and backwards on all over the place in terms of home video formats. And that's how it stood for the films on home video for a good number of years after that point. They never had any major special features, and on DVD, they were actually still locked into being early 1997 discs with very not good <laughs> transfers that very much showed their age uh, actually quite early on. Warner didn't revisit them or upgrade them besides maybe some repackagings or just still selling the snapper cases over and over. And, you know, technically all of them were ports of their Laserdisc and VHS source masters. So the actual video masters themselves were even older than the 1997 discs were. 
So uh, Warner was kind of just doing this with a lot of films, and a lot of us fans were were hoping that there would be some sort of special edition and at least some sort of extras and a new transfer for all four films at some point. And then finally, in 2005, Warner delivered the Batman motion picture anthology, which finally gave all four films new transfers and new special editions with new extras, but that also meant new audio presentations as well. This is the original DVD box with the nice sort of metallic uh, foil effect on the inner case and this sort of cut through design. So the actual lid of the box sits on top of it and then has this open uh, space around the bat shield. And so of course you merely slip the top off and the DVDs are inside. This is one of the fancier boxes Warner did in their DVD era. It's not the fanciest that you'll come across, but I just really love the design and it's something unique. So I've always enjoyed this box. And then this did get replicated for the very initial Blu-ray release where they did a very kind of comically slimmed down, smaller miniature version of this uh, particular package. I will also mention there's a nice sort of um, higher quality finish on this. And additionally, on the back, it's a little touch. I don't know how well it will actually come across on camera. But the actual covers on here are, are, are sort of have a gloss on them in terms of the actual printed cover images. And then, of course, you get an actual listing of each film and sort of the basic extras of each being a two-disc special edition. Now, you do kind of have to slip these in and out very carefully to not damage the actual shield portion because it's just a little thin piece of cardboard so that that's a little finicky but i still just love this design we got simple new uh, custom special edition keep cases for each film replicating the original artwork each with new spines and then the back showing the contents of all of the new extras and the two discs worth of bonus features now this is still the bulk of all of the modern extras in fact it's like i'd say 99% of the extras on all the Blu-rays and the UHDs are still based off of these 2005 extras. In fact, the Blu-rays are basically just HD ports of these 2005 DVDs, and then the UHDs maybe added one or two additional very tiny little featurettes, and otherwise it's still the extras from the 2005 releases. We got new custom labels for each film, and then it's a secondary bonus disc, but of course, no printed materials, no booklets, no inserts. And this is kind of how Warner handled most of their, well, really, if not all of their two disc special editions from 2005 onwards on DVD. You just got a new keep case, a second disc of extras, maybe a fancier box containing all of them, but that was pretty much it. They did the same thing when they finally revisited the Superman films around this time. Here we have the new case for Returns new spine and the new rear with the extras then of course the new disc labels here's forever's new case spine and artwork with new extras and then the new two disc labels and then because every poison ivy action figure comes with this here's batman and robin on the newer special edition case Here's the new extras and disc labels. Now, these were finally the special editions that all of us fans have been clamoring for. We finally got new widescreen anamorphically enhanced transfers that were no longer old ports of Laserdisc Masters, not done very well as very early launch era DVD releases. Uh, we, of course, lost the opened up presentations on those flipper discs, so these were widescreen only, uh, but they had a much healthier presentation and bitrate. They also added the entire supplements package, which, of course, included the multi-part feature documentary, other documentaries all about the making of the films. We got brand new director commentaries on all four films. And then we even got some of the Batman Forever deleted scenes taken from a work print. And this kind of reignited the discussion about getting the original version of Batman Forever released. And it was maybe rumored that Joel Schumacher might get to do a director's cut of the film for this DVD set. But unfortunately, that, that never came to pass. And he was not able to do that. Uh, and so unfortunately, he did pass away 
uh, a couple years ago, and uh, that just never got to happen. So hopefully we do still get to see some version of uh, even just one of the Batman Forever work prints that's sort of circulating right now. See some sort of official release to get a, a the, more of that deleted material out there. But this DVD was the first time we got to see any of those uh, deleted scenes, uh, even though they were in rough work print form. So the extras on here were, were quite substantial. But when you look at the transfers, uh, these were new image harvest, new scans, new masters prepared for this. And so they also had new audio presentations. All four films had 5.1 tracks in both Dolby Digital and DTS, which of course had a much beefier uh, codec, or I should say bit rate, uh, than Dolby did on DVD. So these were also trying to aim more for the home theater DVD enthusiast market by including a DTS audio option, which Warner did not do all the time. So that, that was was, that was also kind of unique for these. Now, when you look at the actual transfers and audio, they are, of course, far and away better than what preceded them on, in terms of the 97 DVDs. However, for the Burton films, you still have to deal with the fact that they're not as properly dark as they should be. They are darker than the older video masters, but they're still not at that theatrical supreme darkness throughout. So it's a big improvement visually, but the Burton films are still a, a little bit brightened because this is still 2005. Uh, we're, we, we're, we weren't quite yet, obviously, in the HD realm, and I guess it was... You know, the best that could be done at the time with typical Warner practices. So these are better in that regard, but they're still not all the way there. The 5.1 tracks are seemingly brand new uh, harvests of original source material. So they are thankfully not complete remixes from the ground up. There's no new effects or anything. But for 89 and Returns, you will notice they do sound different to all of the previous versions, particularly 89's 5.1 on here in terms of both the Dolby and DTS, does not have all that wonderful low end and that warmth of the earlier mix that I love so much. So if you compare this even to the 97 DVD, you'll notice the 5.1 sounds different. Um, it, it's like it's got a, a, a different sort of EQ or a different sort of balance. And it's rumored that perhaps they maybe utilize the 70 millimeter mix for as, as their source for, for this transfer of the this 5.1 presentation. So uh, this is where maybe the 70 millimeter mix comes into play versus perhaps the previous releases reflecting more of what you heard on the 35 millimeter standard general release mix. And again, this is all conjecture because we don't have anything official, but uh, this is when uh, I first started noticing that 89 sounded different. Of course, the DTS codec is at a, it's, it's done at a much higher bit rate, so, and it's also mastered a bit louder, so when you level match them, you will still notice that the DTS does try to be at least a bit more in your face, as most DTS tracks on even DVD did, so you can play a, a comparison game between the Dolby and DTS renderings, but it is the same audio track. Returns has 5.1 in Dolby and DTS as well, and it does seem to sort of build on what the 5.1 sounded like on the 97 DVD. Again, I can't be for sure if this is 100% the exact same as the theatrical audio track, just like I can't for the 97 DVD, but I do think there is a slight difference between uh, the tracks on here and the track on the 97 DVD, so I think it's fun to, to play, a, to do a comparison between the two, but I think it's maybe more down to just EQ and, and, and slight mix discrepancies in terms of the mastering, because I think the source mix is the same. Again, the DTS is a little bit louder, a little bit more forceful, than the Dolby track on here, which is pretty much what you're going to get with every DTS and uh, Dolby track that's on the same disc. Uh, the DTS was just meant to be beefier and so mastered a little bit louder, but it's the same 5.1 source track. Then you get to the Schumacher films, and Forever again has a 5.1 track in Dolby and DTS, so you don't have the important Matrix stereo track that I love, but it still sounds like the same 5.1 overall as what was on the previous releases, so it should be still the theatrical 5.1 
one mix. Again, I do think there's maybe a few little differences in EQ because this sounds a little bit different than the Laserdisc N97 DVD 5.1, but overall it seems pretty much the same. And again, the DTS is a bit beefier in its uh, bit rate and is mastered a little bit louder than the Dolby track. The odd thing though is the picture quality is not at the same level as other, uh, really the other films in this set, because it seems like they handle the Schumacher films a little bit differently. And this becomes much more apparent when we talk about the Blu-ray upgrades of these because they use the same base masters as these SE DVDs. But I think there was some DNR application because Forever looks noticeably a bit softer. And uh, again, this is really uh, acerbated when we get to talking about the Blu-ray and that's when it becomes really noticeable. But uh, for some reason, Forever in this master and then more so on the 1080p Blu-ray is probably the, the least good Good looking of all four films because I think it just had a little bit of processing applied, which it really didn't need at all. And then Batman and Robin follows suit, having only two versions of a 5.1 track with the DTS sounding louder and beefier simply due to the nature of DTS on DVD. It is, of course, much much improved over the old 97 DVD in terms of the overall transfer. It does look maybe a little bit better than Forever because I don't think it had as much processing applied to it, but it seems like maybe it had a little bit. So again, I think both Schumacher films on these masters don't quite look as good as they should and thus don't look as good as the treatment given to the Burton films. So uh, at this point, I think both Schumacher films actually kind of suffer a little bit visually, uh, even though I think the Batman and Robin fares a little bit better than how Forever was handled. And then we move a couple years down the road to the point at which it was after the format wars had ended and Warner had gone entirely Blu-ray. And they did do, uh, well, most of their Blu-rays were basically HD bumps or slight upgrades or 1080p bumps of previously released special edition DVDs. So ironically, kind of like their early release uh, DVDs, these all had generic early Warner pop-up menus that you had to navigate to, and they basically just took the source masters for special edition DVDs and just put them out in 1080p with the same extras package being recycled, and that was basically it. So uh, pretty much every early Warner disc is a title that was done as a special edition DVD or and or HD DVD. So they were designed around uh, early HD constraints for both HD DVD and Blu-ray in terms of the bitrate and encoding and audio codecs. But they were basically just slight, uh, really they were kind of just ports of special edition DVDs with just a slight uptick in picture quality to 1080p and then maybe in certain instances the audio would get an upgrade to lossless Dolby True HD. So that's what happened on the Batman films when they finally turned up on Blu-ray. They were essentially 1080p versions of the 2005 special edition DVD masters complete with the 5.1 tracks being carried over and being rendered out in Dolby True HD. So technically, you got a slight audio upgrade, although you did lose the DTS presentations of that same 5.1 on on the um, from the DVDs themselves. So basically, it was just a True HD codec version of the same 5.1 uh, audio revisit Warner had already done. The same extras packages carried over, all in standard def, and all of these were done as early Warner discs, so they have those pop-up menus you have to navigate to. So basically what you're getting was the upgrade to 1080p and the slight uh, upgrades to Dolby True HD for the audio and that was it because these were early Blu-rays. They did initially sell them in a slimmed down version of the anthology box which I missed out on. I later picked them up in the budget-friendly four film favorites Blu-ray which was released. Now this does replicate the generic logo covers that were used on the uh, Blu-ray cases themselves and all these standalone releases. And these were taken from the initial UK and European discs, which did come out before we did got them over here, which is kind of weird, but that's just how it happened. This was at a time when Warner decided they were going to try and continue their successful four film favorites DVD lineup on Blu-ray, with obviously the artwork being in blue because it was Blu-ray. 
but it's the same aesthetic of putting four discs and four films into a single affordable package. And this being from the Batman disc, they're already single disc Blu-rays. It is basically getting you the entirety of the anthology set and one affordable slim package. So that's why I went with this years ago because it was the budget option. Usually you don't find this with the slipcover anymore. So you'll just see it looking like this in a standard Blu-ray case with your standard credits on the back and then the uh, technical info with all these being in widescreen with Dolby True HD 5.1. Now, unfortunately, they've got the discs stacked on top of each other, but uh, if you handle this properly, it, it's it, the discs will be fine, but they, they should have just gone for an actual uh, hinged tray for all four. As you can see, they just copied the same disc one labels from the special edition DVDs. So you do lose the uh, the disc two labels, obviously, because they were able to get everything onto a single Blu-ray. And of course, here are the discs for Returns and Batman and Robin. So this is the easiest way and cheapest way to pick up the Blu-rays, just as it was back in the day when these came out. Again, these are essentially 1080p upgrades of the 2005 presentations. They are the same source masters, and they have the audio upgraded to Dolby True HD with all of the supplements being carried over. So essentially this replaced the SE DVDs. Uh, that means it does have the same issues. The Burton films do look better in 1080p from, from this rendering of their Source Master uh, instead of being bounced down to, to standard F DVD. But they're still not properly dark enough, and so they're, they're, again, better, but they're still not quite there yet. And again, you have the same audio quirks I mentioned before because this is the same 5.1 track, just in a different codec. Uh, again, Forever looks the worst of the four, and the processing and DNR I was talking about that made the DVD not look so hot is really obvious here, and it's definitely the one Blu-ray that looks like uh, somebody uh, tinkered around with it, and it just kind of looks mushy in spots, and it does not look very good, unfortunately, so... It is, I think, the worst looking of the four films on Blu-ray and, and shouldn't. But again, because I think that work was done for the original, it baked into the master itself, it's just much more apparent on the 1080p Blu-ray release than it was on the 2005 DVD. So unfortunately, I think Forever does not look like it should and does suffer in its picture quality. Batman and Robin, again, has a little degree of that because they handled the Schumacher films a bit differently on the Source Master, but I don't think it looks quite as poor as Forever does in spots. But it does have some of that, and it does look more apparent because, again, you're now seeing it in 1080p HD versus, you know, 480p on a standard def DVD because, again, all of these Blu-rays are from the 2005 Source Masters, which probably were done in 2004 for the 2005 DVD release. So these were already aged masters. This is, again, Warner doing the Batman films as a sort of early, if not launch, format title for a, for a new format. So just like the 97 DVDs, then we finally got these on Blu-ray, but it was early and sort of stage one or two era for Warner uh, Blu-rays. I run out of space. And then that finally brings us to the current version and release, which was the 2019 4K UHDs. So this finally meant brand new image harvests and scans and audio transfers for all four films because I couldn't get away with using the old masters again. And we got these individual releases with these sort of hollow foil slip covers with the reflection, uh, reflective quality to them. And they all had the new, uh, rather uninspired generic artwork, which we first saw pop up on streaming services. Uh, each of the four films got one of these slip covers in the initial pressing run. 
And then rather annoyingly, they did finally do a box set version of all of these, but it came out long after the individual releases came out. It didn't have the slip covers and the artwork was rather generic and it's just basically a slip box. So um, that's probably the, the most affordable way to get them now, but you don't get the slip covers and also, um, you know, it's, it's kind of overpriced and not, not, not a very good box to begin with because it's just containing the, the standalone cases of each of the UHDs. So that's why uh, you've got basically the standalones. Hopefully you can find it with the slip covers or your other option is picking up the box set or uh, there's also a steelbook variant as well. Now to talk about each release and technical aspects, we go to 89 and this of course received a new 4K scan with HDR application and a new Dolby Atmos sound remix. This of course means we finally have a modern 4K scan for both Burton films, and they finally do not have a large amount of brightness or brightening up of the image applied to them. So in terms of the release that closest replicates the original darker theatrical appearance of both films, the UHDs are by far and away the closest to that experience. Uh, of course, you do have to look at the HDR grading, and then you also have to look at the overall Overall color timing which at least on 89 is solid but unfortunately I think it has some modern color timing baked in a little bit and like a lot of earlier Warner discs the color timing can be debatable and Warner's UHDs are not up to the same level as other studios so you know you, you wish the encoding could be better and the HDR could be a bit better and um, but at the very least we did finally get a new scan and it is a 4k scan and we are at least getting something that better approximates the visual appearance of the original release prints even if it is unfortunately imperfect thankfully they did also make brand new blu-rays so they are included here and they are from the 4k master so it's not as most releases where they either skip a Blu-ray or they just throw the old disc in. Uh, so the we do get the new 4K transfers on the 1080p Blu-rays. So you can look at those in SDR if you don't uh, if you haven't upgraded to 4K as of yet, which is why I went ahead and got these. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think the Blu-rays are as, as good as the UHDs in terms of the color handling, so I do think that kind of exacerbates some things baked into the master when you look at 89 on the 1080p disc, uh, which isn't as as big of a problem as it is on, on the UHD. So I think the UHD is superior in that regard because I think because of the limitations and because the way these were mastered, the, the Blu-rays have, have a bit more of that issue. The other element is the Atmos Remix, which was done completely from the ground up with completely new effects throughout and changes the entire sonic character of the film and is a mix I think is atrocious because it also messes with the levels, the music levels, the dialogue levels, everything sounds... If you know this film, this, this remix sounds terribly wrong, and it's filled with brand new effects throughout. So the wonderful sort of sonic character of the original mix being part of the experience of the film where you can't quite tell what time period you're in, where it's got elements of the 30s, elements of the 50s, elements of the 80s, and it's sort of a world in and of itself. That's gone in the sound mix. It's now a full-blown modern Atmos affair as most Warner UHDs with Atmos remixes go for. So I think the audio on this is horrible because Warner did not include any version of the original audio mix on either the Blu-ray or the UHD. It is only the Atmos mix or uh, it will be folded down to 7.1 if you don't have Atmos. So this only has a bastardized remixed version of the audio with completely new effects that does not represent the film's original audio whatsoever. And I think for me, that makes these discs unwatchable because all four films were remixed and none of them contain their original audio. So for all of the benefits of having a new 4K scan and the better picture quality, um, in spite of them not being perfect, it's completely undone for me by not having any original audio presentation. Not even the 5.1 True HD tracks from the Blu-rays, which most people thought would be carried over. 
Uh, Warner has done this a number of times, and actually when they put out the Mad Max films on UHD, they did uh, not include original audio, but then actually carried out a recall program and put out new pressings that did have some form of original audio to address that problem, but they never addressed the, the glaring problem same problem on the Batman films. In particular, it's even more glaring because these Atmos remixes are horribly and obviously revisionist and filled with new effects throughout and honestly, I think, sound terrible. Um, so I will never choose to watch these and these just sit on my shelf and kind of gather dust. And the only way that you can actually enjoy these is to do a custom remix job yourself and capture an older audio track and try to then resync it to this new 4K master and then basically make your own version that actually has the film's proper audio, depending on which audio track you prefer. And it shouldn't be up to fans to preserve the soundtrack of an actual film itself due to a studio's incompetence but as you can tell this kind of gets me hot and bothered and warner should have admitted their mistake and done a recall program and at the very least included the 5.1 true hd tracks from the blu-rays if not actually doing what they should have done in the first place which is actually restoring all proper versions of the film's theatrical audio presentations and actually including them on disc but unfortunately most people just don't care about film sound and that's kind of the thing that flies under the radar and then you get cases like these where you have new transfers that while they're not perfect they're far and away better than what we've had before but they fail entirely on not having any form of original audio. And for fans, they're really unwatchable because all you're going to do is notice how bad and out of place the Atmos remix is for the entire feature. And that is the, just a gigantic mark against these. The other is we have no new extras. We're just recycling the same 2005 extras over again. Uh, we don't even have the the one or two extras that were on one of the standalone versions of 89. So all four films need new extras, you know, at least some new material because so much stuff has come to light, let alone giving us a proper extended or, uh, you know, work print version of Batman Forever and actually acknowledging it. So... Again, these are a missed opportunity, and because they're earlier UHDs, once again, we have the Batman films kind of used as sort of launch titles, and they're stuck with a lot of the issues that Warner would have at the start of a new format. So it happened on DVD in 97, it happened on the initial Blu-rays, and now it's happened on the initial UHDs. So we, of course, have the slipcover with the same generic artwork on the back. Take that off, and we have the standard case with this rather uninspired artwork that, again, first popped up on streaming services. And you open the cases, and no booklets, no printed material, but we at least have these newer disc labels. And this is the aesthetic used on all four films. So again, 89 does fare better in its picture quality. It's at least finally darker, like closer approximating what the original release prints look like. And I just think there, there are some issues with the color grading and the HDR application. Uh, but the, the, the real deal breaker is not having any form of original audio and a horribly revisionist uh, Atmos remix with brand new effects from the ground up that just sounds horrible and really will drive fans of this film crazy who, who have seen it hundreds of times. Then we have the same four returns with the sort of hollow foil type slip cover, generic spine, then the rear, and of course slip this off and we have the same design aesthetic underneath with the very uninspired cover, the same rear, and then the new disc labels. And then we talk about the actual tech specs. Again, no new extras, recycling all the 2005 extras once again. We do get the benefit of the new transfer, which is at least also darker and the best technical presentation as of yet. And unfortunately, though, there is a problem because uh, the slight color issues, I think, are on 89 
are massive ones here because the film is very famous for its usage of snow and refrigerated sets. And so it's, of course, one of the great Christmas films. Well, that means there's there's a lot of cold, uh, you know, visuals as well. And there's a lot of scenes where you have winter lighting. And when you see an original release print, especially, you'll notice the texture and the nuance of all of the cold blues and the lighting and the sets and all of the winter scenes and throughout the film that characterize it. Well, unfortunately, when the color grading was done on this, it's been pushed more into what is really just more of a teal coloring, which is not theatrically accurate, and no previous version has done this. Um, the previous video versions are, of course, based around their uh, format standards of the time, and they're not meant to be archival, but they don't have this color problem. And since I have seen not just an original release print in the past couple of years, but actually Warner Brothers vaulted copy from their um, releasing entity. And it, I actually got to look at it, and it was a 1992 Fuji color print that was perfectly preserved. I do know what this film looks like on an original release print, and it had none of the teal coloring that is on here. And it's so in your face that if you know this film, even from the previous video versions, it's going to feel a little bit weird. Uh, and again, not that the video versions previously are a perfect reference, but at least they give you an idea. So unfortunately, the color grading here is really off. And so anytime you have uh, the cold blues that are supposed to be there, they are unfortunately teal. And that does affect even some of the most iconic moments, like even the uh, iconic bit of Michael Keaton's Bruce Wayne standing up into the reflected bat signal when he's brooding in Wayne Manor at the start of the film. Well, if you notice, the cold blue of the reflected bat signal light is now full-blown teal, and this runs throughout the whole film, which also does have a few other color grading issues because of that problem. So, unfortunately, while it's at least finally darker, the color grading here is a massive problem and reason alone to make most fans really not like this disc. We do also get a remastered Blu-ray once again, which also does kind of exacerbate some of the problems of, of the color timing, unfortunately, so the remastered Blu-ray isn't helpful. And if that wasn't bad enough, we once again have no original audio and are stuck with another Atmos remix with brand new sound effects that stick out like a sore thumb. And this is really grating because, of course, Returns was the launch title for Dolby Digital 5.1. So it is very important for being the sort of launch title of the 5.1 discrete era, at least for the Dolby format so to not have that historically groundbreaking 5.1 track on here in any form is a major disservice to the history and development and preservation of film sound itself so not only did warner really screw up by not including the original audio and remixing the film without its original audio design characteristics in mind it also screwed over film sound preservation because there is no preservation of the very first dolby digital 5.1 track on this UHD. So I really hate this disc because of the audio situation and the color timing. And I know I'm one of the only people to talk about the color timing, but I do have history with this film and it really gets to me because I have seen Warner Brothers preserved 1992 release print in the past couple of years. And I know what this film is supposed to look like and it does not have any teal in it. Unfortunately, the UHD has it all over the place. Thankfully, the Schumacher films here are handled about as well as they probably could be visually. So the 4K transfer for forever has none of the issues of the uh, of the previous master dating back to the 2005 DVD. Uh, it, it looks quite wonderful with so much more detail that you know it really underlines how crummy the uh, 2005 and uh, disc and the uh, first Blu-ray looked. We again have the uh, hollow foil uh, slip cover, same sort of design for the back. Then we have the uninspired art on the case and the same artwork on the rear. And then the new sort of disc labels for the remastered Blu-ray and the new UHD. This follows suit, of course, with no new extras. And again, only having an Atmos remix without any version of the original audio. And since Forever is still one of my favorite films from childhood that really bugs me because I can tell when the new sections come up uh, the Schumacher films were not as 
heavily overdone as as the remixes of the Burton films, but the they are still definitely remixes and they have new effects and they've gone in and screwed with stuff. So for me, it's just as bad. But uh, for for most people, it's probably not going to be as obvious as the sound changes on the Burton films. But uh, it was again a, a gigantic mistake and really the 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 biggest issue on these is not having the original audio in any form and with forever there's also no presentation of any of the uh, cut or missing footage or any uh, recognition of the original version of the film or what's now talked about as the Schumacher cut and when they did this 4k scan and master this would have been the perfect time to at least present a scan of one of the work prints or have some sort of feature at talking about the original shooting script or something but no, we didn't get any efforts. Uh, again, we do get those same deleted scenes from a work print, but they're in standard def because they're still part of the 2005 DVD extras, and they're not super encoded well on, on either the Blu-rays or the UHDs, so really they still look best when watched on the 2005 DVDs themselves because they've just been ported over and over. So that again goes to the fact that there's no new material here. The only new thing was the new package, the new 4K scan, HDR grading, which got ported to the remastered Blu-ray, and then this new terrible Atmos remix replacing any original audio, which again is why these just gathered dust on my shelf outside of redoing them myself and syncing up the original audio tracks to the new 4K masters. Then we get Batman and Robin with the slip cover, same design aesthetic, same rear, and then the new disc labels for UHD and new Blu-ray. Just like forever, the picture transfer on here looks really stupendous is far and away beyond anything we saw in the previous releases uh, the HDR on the UHD really helps to elevate that even over the uh, remastered blu-ray but both look excellent so I think forever and uh, Batman and Robin really are, are have some visual standout moments for sure once again, unfortunately, though, we only have an Atmos remix. Like Forever, it's not going to be as obvious in terms of all the new stuff that's been done in terms of effects and, and remixing as the Burton films for most people. But if you've seen Batman and Robin a number of times, you're, you're going to notice this stuff, and it is very annoying, and there should be a version of the original audio on here. And once again, Warner just said, oh, yeah, the original sound, that's not important. It's only half the film experience. No, everything's got to be a remix. Everybody wants Atmos now, even though how many houses or home theater setups really do have an Atmos set up? It's only a particular market share, and, you know, UHD is only a particular market share anyway, so you're shooting yourself in the foot, Warner, and you're insulting the history of film sound and the history of these films, but... Again, unfortunately, studios don't care about these things, and most people don't seem to think that film sound is actually important to preserve because they're stupid. So again, no new extras, although I do believe all modern releases of Batman and Robin drop the R. Kelly music video, so that's going to be uh, something you have only on the older releases. Otherwise, it's the same extras package dating back to the 2005 SE DVD, and the only new bits of anything are, of course, the new 4K transfer, the new discs themselves, the new rather uninspired artwork, and the Atmos remix in favor of having any original audio presentation. So all in all, I unfortunately think the UHDs are definitely a mixed bag, even though technically they're far beyond what we've gotten before in terms of the picture transfers. I think all the Atmos remixes on here are terrible, and I will never watch these films again with those. I can't stand them, and they should have had some form of original audio present on these, and to not have the original audio of a film present on a disc at all is not only unforgivable, unacceptable, but it's also downright lazy and shows a lack of care because it's only a tiny file size that can be added to a disc, and particularly you have a UHD, you've got tons of space. But unfortunately, this is the Warner Studio label we're talking about, who frequently cuts corners, makes mistakes, and they get baked into film releases. So that, in addition to the Burton film still having color problems, returns especially having massive color grading problems, and the fact that we still have no new extras, and not even a scrap of material about the longer, darker version of Batman Forever still uh, really makes these discs I don't return to, 
and discs I don't enjoy watching, and the only way I can enjoy or look at the 4K masters is to make my own version with a, a, an original audio track synced to the 4K masters and doing that work myself, essentially, which is not something you should have to do. So there you have it, my overall video release history of the original four Batman films uh, from Warner Home Video across the formats from essentially 1989 to the present and the 4K masters on the UHD releases. Unfortunately, I think there are still some massive issues with the UHDs that really keep them from being the uh, best enjoyed uh, editions for fans. So unfortunately, I do think you do need to have previous editions for superior and actual original audio presentations. Uh, even if you just have the original Blu-rays, you do get a nice True HD 5.1 track based on the original audio without any remixing or um, any new effects in terms of a remix like you have and are stuck with on the modern UHD releases. So in terms of audio, I think you do have to have at least some, if not a few, different previous releases. But I do think there's interesting elements of all the past releases, and looking at the opened up versions on the flipper discs and the VHS tapes is always fascinating. So it's nice to have those alternate ratio presentations around as well. And I really love the Laserdisc still, so those, those are usually my most spun versions because I still enjoy the Laserdisc format, and I really love the soundtracks, and the picture transfers on all four are, are nice if you can find non-rotted copies of Returns and Batman and Robin. So, again, because I have a lot of issues with the UHDs, those are still the, the versions I, I, I enjoy the most is, is spinning up the Laserdisc because I have a good setup and I like the format um, and those are just still really enjoyable to watch and some of them I think have the, the best available soundtracks as of now. So as always, I hope my babblings about the Batman films and home video releases and video release histories has been at least somewhat fun and informative. If you ever wondered what the inside of my head was like, well, I think about this stuff all the time and I have this rattling around in my brain. So this has been a, a lot of years of collecting the films and uh, getting more into their transfer histories and doing all kinds of research on my own. So none of this is easy to figure out or, or stuff that's printed anywhere. And it, it really should be made more apparent or there should be some transparency between studios and even just regular consumers buying discs about the, the transfer process, you know, even if it's just a little about the transfer blurb like you'd get on a boutique label release, just to have some information over the years, because otherwise you're like me and you feel like a crazy person with all these copies, you're trying to figure out how they were made and why there are variations in the picture and sound and finding old random articles or, or, or newspaper articles or mentions of the video masters of the Burton films being brightened up for the, for the time period and, and the telecineing of, of the, the actual film elements and the video master preparation and then being able to realize, oh, that's why they look this certain way. And then it, there, you have to just figure this stuff out yourself and see rare print screenings or look at the films on their 16 millimeter versions or and, and look at old film clips and trailers and, and music videos and different things so it's it's a lot of it's a lot of research to do and um, that's why I decided to put this out in video form so uh, I, I do hope you have gotten something out of out of my out of my Batman on video babblings I do always do this kind of work with films I, I love and adore or I come across multiple versions of anyway but with the Batman films I've had a particular focus on their transfer history over the years because I grew up with them and started noticing uh, how, how they started to vary and differ on different formats and presentations so this has been something I've, I've really worked on for for most of my life actually so this is this is a lot of years of, of work and tinkering around and trying to figure this stuff out so uh, I do hope this at least encourages you to maybe check out some of the other video versions or look at perhaps older copies you've had over the years or maybe seek out some of the other versions and look at the transfers and the soundtracks and maybe find a, a new favorite disc or copy to spin in addition to having the blu-rays and the UHDs as well so as always, uh, please do keep supporting boutique and studio labels wherever possible by buying films on disc to help keep physical media and film culture alive. And as always, thank you ever so much for watching. We're five little formats of an everyday video sort. You'll find us all in an eBay search. 
in a e i o u vowels. Not entirely unclever, sir, but what do all these video editions have in common? What do these video issues and problems mean? Every video release in Riddle contains a number, and they arrived in this order. 22, 2, 8, and 3. Meaning? Letters of the alphabet? Of course! 22 is V, 2 would be B, 8 would be H, and 3 would be C. V, B, H, C. Perhaps 2 and 3 are 23. 23 is W. V, H, W. How about W, H, V? W, H, V? And another name for a video label? Home Video! W, H, V. Warner Home Video. Warner Brothers. These issues are obviously a sign of Warner's gonna Warner. You really are quite bright, despite what people say. Are all the editions available? All except the archival version in Pixar and Sound, but it hasn't been tested. Tonight's a good night. You don't really think you'll win, do you? <laughs> Things change.